Welcome to the Amateur Academic. I'm Paramount St. Clair. In our last lecture, we discussed nanotechnology, predicting the future. We took a tour of the nano realm. We ended up talking about these guys, carbon nanotubes. In this lecture, we're going to talk about why they're so awesome. So, why are they awesome anyway? Well, there are two main properties that make carbon nanotubes so cool. They are tensile strength and their semiconductor capabilities. Let's talk about their tensile strength, shall we? Tensile strength, what is that? Well, tensile strength is how much you can pull something apart before it breaks. It's measured in pascals for pressure. Right here we have it measured in G, PA giga pascals. Now, notice that this graph here is a logarithmic graph because scientists and engineers love logarithmic graphs. Carbon nanotubes are at 200 GPA. Is that good? Well, let's compare that to graphite fibers. Thereby, 4.7 GPA. Okay? Kevlar, the thing that you would think of as very strong because it protects people's lives from bullets, is only 3.4 GPA. Stainless steel. Now that's something you really think is very strong. It's only 1.5 GPA. Comparing that to 200 of carbon nanotubes. So carbon nanotubes are some of the strongest material we've ever created. That's why they're awesome in the strength department. How about a semiconductor? We're going to focus here on the carrier mobility. That's how well electrons can pass through the material. Carbon nanotubes have a carrier mobility of 100,000 centimeters squared per volt second. How good is that? Well, let's compare this to something we know. Let's take silicon. Silicon has a carrier mobility of 1,400 centimeters squared per volt second. That means that carbon nanotubes have a higher carrier mobility by more than a factor of 70 over silicon. So to say these things are very good conductors and semiconductors is quite an understatement. These are quite possibly some of the best conductive materials we've ever made. So if they're so awesome, let's find out a little bit more about them. There are all kinds of different properties to learn about. For example, you have your, your single-walled carbon nanotube and your multi-walled carbon nanotube. You can't simply think of a multi-walled carbon nanotube as just simply more than a single wall. They have different properties, different tensile strengths, carrier mobility. They're almost like completely different materials. They range in size. You can even get one down from what I've heard to 0.43 nanometers for a single wall one, whereby with these you can stack them and make them very, very wide. So they come in a lot of different shapes symmetries, sizes, which we also won't discuss here, but that determines their properties, which is very, very important. So the big question is, if they're so awesome, why aren't they everywhere? Why don't we have them in our clothes? Why don't we have them in our golf clubs, our bikes, our cars? They're so strong and cool, why aren't they everywhere? That's a very good question. And there are three problems that prevent them from being in mass production and being ubiquitous in all of our goods. Those three problems are mixture, resistance, and alignment. Now, no, this is just a really awesome photo. This is not uh, anything to do with these problems. This is actually a batch of carbon nanotubes being pulled. And when they're pulled, they actually attach to each other, creating these fibers. It looks very cool. Let's first talk about mixture. Well, there are two basic types of carbon nanotubes, that is, metallic and semiconductor. If you want to build cool electronic devices, you're going to need the semiconductor kind. Well, the problem is, when you make a batch of them, they're mixed together. So how do you get out only the ones you want, the good semiconductor ones? That's the first problem. Number two is resistance. When you build electronics with these guys, you have to have a connector connecting them. The shorter the connector, the greater the resistance. Number three, alignment. 
When they're so teeny weeny, how exactly do you place them where they need to be? Do you get some tweezers or putting them where they need to go is a huge problem, and that's the alignment problem. But they have come up with some answers for these and some other things. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to actually take you on an interactive timeline, once again, using our Prezi, to take us on a tour of carbon nanotubes and their history, discussing the past all the way to the present and the future of this remarkable material. It all starts in 1952, when Soviet scientists discovered what they described as 50 nanometer hollow carbon fibers. Now, the problem was, no one in the West actually heard about this research because of the Iron Curtain. So dot dot dot, we move along and all the way to 1976, and the scientist Indo coming up with the Indo process of creating what he described as hollow tubes of rolled up graphite using a chemical vapor growth technique. Now you have to think of this technique like when you start a fire and you get some soot. That soot is of course carbon. And in this case, that carbon in this chemical process are the nanotubes. The endo process is one of the processes used today to still create carbon nanotubes. Another process was invented in 1979 by Abramson. This process used a carbon anode discharging electricity to create the byproduct of this soot. Moving right along, we have in 1981, finally, someone suggesting that carbon nanotubes are formed by graphene layers rolled into cylindrical objects. 1987, was a big year for carbon nanotubes because the first patent in the U.S. was registered for cylindrical discrete carbon fibrils as a production process by Tenet. But when were carbon nanotubes considered carbon nanotubes? Well, that's in 1991 by this man right here, Lujima. He published his paper on carbon nanotubes where he described the properties and structure of carbon nanotubes. This brought them into the mainstream. People assumed then in a few years, that they would be everywhere and in everything, although they weren't. Moving to 2013, in Stanford, they created the first carbon nanotube computer. The processing capability was on par with the first Intel processor, so it wasn't really that fast or amazing, but they did create the first transistors from carbon nanotubes. Moving to 2014 and 2015, we solved those three problems. One, the mixture. To solve the mixture problem, they used an organic etching process. They coated the carbon nanotubes in them, and then they heated up the whole batch so that the metallic ones would get, of course, hotter than the semiconductor ones, and the organic matter on top would burn away, and the metallic carbon nanotubes would be no more. They would be vaporized, leaving only the awesome semiconductor ones. Problem number two was solved by IBM with contacts at the end instead of on the sides, and they used a different material as the connectors to decrease the resistance. Number three, the alignment problem. Instead of going and getting tweezers, they used dose-controlled floating evaporate self-assembly, which is a fancy way of saying they suspended it in a liquid like water to allow it to then self-assemblate. Once these three problems were solved, many years after they thought they would have been solved, we get into 2016. In 2016, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, scientists created carbon nanotube transistors that outperformed silicon. What they did was they created a 140 nanometer node of carbon nanotubes, and they tested that against an even smaller 90 nanometer silicon P-channel MOSFET. So this was a huge breakthrough in 2016, which will lead us to around 2020, IBM and 
many other companies are saying by 2020 we will have processors using carbon nanotubes. Will it be exactly 2020? That we don't know, but it has to be soon because we are, as we've stated in the previous lecture, running out of time with silicon. Silicon is about to meet its maker between 7 and 5 nanometer node length. So they have to be replaced so that we can economically go on as usual with Moore's Law, and that will be carbon-based technology. So that's our little timeline of carbon nanotubes and looking at the history of carbon nanotubes.